Welcome to this edition of INN CEO Talks. Joining me today is Aidan Mills, the CEO of Northstar Clean Technologies, which trades on the TSX Venture under the symbol ROOF. Northstar Clean Technologies is engaged in the commercialization of a proprietary process technology for the repurposing of asphalt shingles and the extraction and recovery of asphalt cement, fiberglass, felt, and mineral aggregates to be sold and used in asphalt pavement, shingle manufacturing, construction projects, and other industrial applications. And this technology solution is expected to have a significant impact on the environment because in particular, it addresses an issue for the construction sector and its environmental footprint namely the demolition of waste in landfills. So the company's proprietary process will reduce the CO2 impact of asphalt, fiber, aggregate production, and it's going to contribute to the circular economy through the repurposing of these materials. So joining me now is Aiden Mills. Aiden, welcome. And what a great uh, concept, proprietary technology that you've put together. Tell us a little bit more about it and why it's going to bring such benefits to the construction sector. Sure. So let's just talk about asphalt shingle tiles and kind of how, how they're made and, and what we're going to do. So um, an asphalt shingle tile is made up of about 50% cement uh, or you know aggregate, 25% asphalt oil and 25% fiber. The older and the older tiles, the fiber is uh, paper. In the newer ones, it's um, it's uh, fiberglass. So our proprietary technology splits those into their individual parts. So we have sales quality uh, bitumen, sales quality uh, fiber, and sales quality uh, aggregate that comes out the back end. And why this is important is if you step back and you look at the US figures, approximately, and so, and you think about the roofing, the housing market and the roofing market, Approximately 80% of all new houses that get built in, in the US are roofed with asphalt shingles. And that's because of a number of different things. They're light, they're long lasting, and they're very, and they're competitive, price competitive versus versus the alternative. So if you think about every, you know, 80% of the roofs, then that actually generates a lot of when those roofs are either being replaced or they're coming off. Um, then that generates a lot of, uh, of shingles that need to be dealt with. So and the, from the US figures perspective, that is 13 million tons a year. Now of that, about 1 million tons get ground up and we used straight into asphalt paving. So straight into, into roads. And it depends on the jurisdiction and it depends. So that's banned in some jurisdictions. It's maybe two to 3% in other jurisdictions. But that's what 1 million tons of the 13 does. The other 12 million tons literally goes straight into landfill. So we believe we have the one of the only proprietary technologies that solves that environmental problem. You know, one of the things that I find very interesting about what you're doing is unlike plastic and paper, when you're wanting to repurpose uh, those products, anything that's post-consumer, very difficult to work with. But as you pointed out, uh, when you're repurposing an asphalt shingle, you're not winding up with compatibility issues once you've separated out the different elements. You can put them back to work quite quickly. So how important is it that, that we recognize, in some ways, the elegance of this process? Well, look, I think the process is, is elegant because I do think at the back end, as you think about those three products, um, so you think about the aggregate sand, you think about the, the fiber that comes out the back end, and you think about the asphalt. From a technology perspective, we know that in the commissioning of the current facility in, that we have built in, uh, in, in, in Delta and BC, we know that that actually is sales quality asphalt. Now, it's hard, so it doesn't necessarily mean that it can go straight back, it can be laid straight on a road. However, it can be put into the blend that gets mixed to make road asphalt. And that is what 
when when people are, are when the manufacturers of asphalt for paving do it, they take n- no, a number of different feedstocks to make the blend for the road asphalt. And we are absolutely a feedstock into that process. For shingle tile, we believe exactly the same thing. We're absolutely uh, an input into that process. And if you think about the broader context, so when we look, and we'll talk a little bit about it, when we look at the revenue model, um, we have a revenue model that has the value from the asphalt shingle and the tipping fee or the landfill fee that we get a percentage of. We have the value of the products that come out the back end. But the other elegance of this is the CO2 footprint. So if you think about those three products and you think about the manufacture, the virgin manufacture of it, asphalt shingles or asphalt comes from a refinery. Aggregate comes from a mine. And so you need to mine it, wash it, clean it. And then the last thing is that the fiber comes from a paper mill. If you think about the CO2 footprint of that, versus the CO2 footprint of our portfolio, we believe there's a significant difference. So not only is there an elegance in that these products can all go to market, but actually there's an elegance in the CO2 benefit of the manufacturer. So you touched a little bit on what your revenue sources are. Uh, can you, you know, give us a bit more insight into where you're going to be making money? Because it's not just in the, the selling of the product, you have other sources of revenue as well. Yeah, so if you think about the just the, the throughput model, asphalt shingles comes into the front end of the process. It then gets, they get ground and, and separated, et cetera, and the three products come out the back end. But we actually have five elements to the revenue model. So the first is the shingles that come in the front end. So let me describe what a tipping fee is. So um, in a market like Calgary, for example, if you bring a ton of asphalt shingles and you bring it to the landfill, as the, the guy who's taken it off the roofs or the collector, you have to pay the landfill $75 a ton. And that differs widely across North America. You know, some, some parts it's 50, some parts it's 150. So, so there's, a, there's a difference of that tipping fee by jurisdiction. But our first revenue source is that we get paid to take the feedstock in, which, look, as a guy who spent 30 years in oil and gas, uh, this is a very interesting business model for me. So it's the first time anybody's ever paid me to take the feedstock off their hands. You know, normally it's the other way around. So that's the first part of the revenue model is, is and, and we believe we have an advantage. So we will locate our plants close, close within like, you know, uh, you know truck transportation distance um, from, from the landfill. So that revenue model, we believe we will have a discount. So the guy is in financially incentivized to go to us. Secondly, will be a quicker offload. So we can offload a truck in 10 minutes. And thirdly, landfills do not want to see shingles turn up. And, but we are absolutely welcoming of that. So, you know, you get a, get a better reception when you come to a North Star facility than you do if you go to the landfill. Out the back end of the facility, we've said fiber and sand, Look, local market prices for each one of those, I don't think any sand buyer is going to be paying us a green premium. But if you think about the asphalt at the back end, think about the pressure, and you mentioned it earlier, think about the pressure that hydrocarbon companies and companies that lay asphalt are under from an ESG perspective. That ESG perspective, in my opinion, is putting pressure on them. And so think if you're a company and you can do a deal with Northstar that says, well, actually, you know, 1% 1% of my volume is renewable. Now, I don't know if we're going to be able to get a renewable designation for the asphalt, or I mean, I just keep on calling it green asphalt. But if you think of the environmental benefit, if you think about the circular nature of that, we believe that that asphalt price um, has significant upside. And then the last overarching kind of benefit is, is, the, is the carbon benefit. And that's, as we chatted about earlier, that's the difference between our production carbon footprint versus the virgin production carbon footprint of the other products. So we think there are five elements to the revenue model. The CO2 analysis, we're, we're, we're undertaking that right now. Um, I can't tell you what that carbon credit benefit looks like, but we think that's going to be the, the overarching addition to the, to, the five, uh, to, the, to the other four elements of the model. Where are you at right now? You've got your facility in Delta. Um, where do you go from here? So 
from an engineering perspective, so, so the, the first thing is a facility in Delta. So the facility in Delta is commissioning. So we believe in the next four to six weeks, we should have the first truck of asphalt coming out the back end. We know um, that the asphalt that we're producing is sales quality asphalt. So we, there's no quality concerns. So now it's about commissioning the plant. We think that the Delta facility should move to steady state production uh, in fourth quarter. And then as we think about the, you know, the default making opportunities, you know, that should be in the you know, second quarter of next year. So broadly speaking, that's, that's the timeline for Delta. So we have an RFP process going on. We have three engineering companies from Calgary in competing to do an RFP um, with us um, and build the next plant. So the next plan, and, and this actually comes back to, you know, a little bit about uh, clean tech and scale up. The Delta facility, we believe probably has a capacity of, you know, 50 to 100 tons a day, roughly, roughly. The new plan, which is taking the proprietary design from Delta and making it and, and essentially optimizing the engineering of it and having it fully engineered. Um, that's what the RFP process is to do. That's what the three companies are, are bidding for. We will, uh, they will bid in September towards the end of the month. Um, we will make the decision in, in October who to proceed with. And the detailed design for the new facility will be ready by the end of Q1. Now, the scale up risk for that is we believe the detailed design, or sorry, we believe the, the, the new facility will probably be, have a capacity of about 150 to 200 tons a day. So the scale up risk is from, you know, 50 to 100 to 150 to 200. It's like times one and a half or times two. So it's not like we're going from a bench scale pilot plant to a 200 ton a day facility. And the process and the technology is commissioned and now it's just about making it more efficient. Then we'll be in the position whereby we have an operating plant, steady state operating plant, and we have design in place for the first facility. And in terms of the timeline about how quickly that can get built, our view is probably by the end of fourth quarter next year. Now, you know, like I'm three days into the end of the full-time job here, so I, I, you know, that's something that we're working on. But we believe a plant is probably, assuming permitting in place, is it probably a six-month build process. So one of the things that we're also starting on, of course, is permitting for the new sites. So investors are looking at this going, okay, that's great. Happy to see that you're going through the stage process of development here in the greater Vancouver area. Long term, what are your plans? And then how do you anticipate being able to take this to scale in multiple markets? Uh, what's the opportunity for investors here? So I think the opportunity for investors uh, is obviously, as I would say, a great one. We talked about the commercial model and where the upside lies. I think we will have a fully designed engineering process ready um, by, the, by the end of first quarter. And then the question is, how fast can we roll it out? Now, my view, and you know, people could say this is, you know, this is not aggressive, but but it, but it's a good stretch. Is this should be able to roll out? We believe from a from a tactical perspective, we should be able to roll out a plant a quarter. And so a lot of the business development action now is, okay, let's identify the markets, let's identify um, the permitting and, and start start that process in the, in the target markets that we're looking at. And if you think about it, this is actually the size of the plant, the 150 to 200 ton a day plant is appropriate for a market of a million people or more. And it's important to think about these plants as well, because what we're not going to do is we're not going to try and stretch the engineering. If a market's four times the size, we're not going to build a plant that is four times the size. We'll build four plants because it should be exactly the same. That's the other thing that we're doing with the engineering study is the engineers are not just building it, but they're also doing process improvement over the longer term. I want plant three to be better than plant two. I want plant 10 to be better than plant seven. And so the optimization and process overview is really important to, to improve the facilities as they go forward. But if you think about the market size, every city that has a million people or more in it can have a repurposing plant. That's a lot of plants. To finance that, are you going to be going back to the market in stages? 
Uh, and so will there be, will growth come through a, a combination of revenue and uh, future financing opportunities? So it's actually, that's a, that's a great question around financing. So if you look at the, if you look at our capital structure today, you know, we have uh, quarterly results came out, you know, last week, we have 10 mil after the IPO, we have $10 million worth of cash on, on, the, on the balance sheet. Um, and our capital structure has less than a million dollars of debt. And our capital structure has no government support. So one of the big things on, on the capital side is the engagement of government and public affairs, the, the government and public affairs strategy, <clears throat> excuse me, to do not only the engagement of the federal, provincial and municipal governments on the support of the permitting process, which we talked about before, but also from a funding perspective. As you think about the Biden plan, as you think about, you know, the, the infrastructure plans in Canada, those are all about technology. They're all about infrastructure. They're all about repurposing, reducing landfill. The city plans, the green city plans are, are, are aggressive in terms of in terms of their, their objectives that this fits brilliantly with, but also there's funding available. So our capital model, we believe, will have equity, of course, um, debt um, from the ESG funds, the debt that is waiting on the sideline for technologies exactly like this, and government, um, you know, you know, federal, provincial, municipal government support. So we 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 can't put our hand on our heart and say, from the commercial model perspective, here's the capital rollout plan, and exactly here, here's how we're going to fund it. But we believe, especially with debt and the low level we have in the company and especially with the government and public affairs, non-dilutive funding, there is a huge leverage of the balance sheet on, on the non-dilutive side that says, look, we we don't believe we need to be going back to the market um, to, you know, to, to fund this whole program because we think there's a significant amount of funding that's available. Well, it's a pretty exciting future you've got ahead of you right at the moment. And I'm hoping that you're going to come back and give us an update here as you start to roll this out. Because I think that you're in a sector that is going to see tremendous growth as the demand for uh, environmental responsibility continues to, to be put on all sectors. Uh, yeah, look, I, I agree. And, and, and if I'm... If, if we were given the snapshot to investors to say... You know all the stuff that we've covered. You know what 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 is the re what is the really key, what are the really key points? I think number one, as we've talked about, this is ready to deliver now. This this isn't an ESG or a clean tech play that need needs scaling up and is delivered in twenty twenty five or twenty thirty. This is actually ready now. As we've talked about, as you summarized there, I mean, this fits incredibly well with the circular economy, the ESG um, oversight, and, and the increased pressure on that. We think, we talked about the revenue buckets. There's significant commercial upside from, from those buckets. We talked about the capital structure and how non-dilutive funding, funding can be added really effectively. But actually, look, one of the things that is is incredibly important to me, and one of the reasons that I'm actually here is... You know, the commercial model is fantastic, but this also solves a huge environmental problem. It solves a 12 million tons a year problem in the U.S., which I think, you know, to, to be part of a journey that uh, that helps that to me is a, 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 it's very, very exciting. Well, I agree with you, and I hope that you're going to come back and give us an update in a couple of months. Yep, look forward to it. Thank you for the time and, uh, don't, you know, happy and uh, hopeful to come back and, uh, and give you an update for sure. Great. Thank you very much for your time. Yep, you too.